Well, thanks for having me on the podcast uh, this morning. Uh, great to be able to speak to you, and thank you for the, the invitation. Um, I work. I'm. A thanks a lot, yeah. Laurent, for joining us. Uh, thanks a lot for um, accepting the invitation. Looking forward to our chat today. We are going to talk a lot about uh, what happened a month ago at the Transport Day at COP26 um, and all stuff related to. Um, destination 2050 but before we dive into that why don't you share with us your personal journey how did you make it to your current role at uh, at airlines for europe and have you ever have you always been um or have you always had some kind of connection with with aviation um no actually i uh i came in mostly from a, a policy perspective i've always been very interested in the policy making mm -hmm. uh, and uh, mostly in policy making on the field of energy policy and climate change so uh before uh, joining a free when it was launched in 2016 um, I was advising companies and government on their on their energy policies um, and uh, and this is how I end up in this situation now and and uh, whilst I initially joined a free when it was created um, to work on uh, airspace issue on consumer files the uh, the agenda uh, both from a, a societal point of view and from a policy point, point of view on the decarbonization in aviation uh, has really caught up uh, as i'm sure you would you would know yourself i mean the past uh, the past two or three years have seen an, an increase in, in demand and, and rightly so an increase in demand and expectations for the aviation sector to to better contribute to the uh, to the climate effort and that has uh, that has also uh, had had a, a change or an, imp an impact on on my own involvement in A4E, and the meaning that I, I now 100% dedicated my time on the future of aviation fuels, the the, um, the, the measures to address CO2 emissions, um, the measures to address the financing of the decarbonization, and, um, and that's what keeps me busy uh, these days. Yeah, definitely we'll have a list, lots to do, not just in 2022, but I think all of us within the sector in the next decades, as there is, a, as Willie Walsh uh, says quite quite often, a challenge of our time, and we all need to work together on it. So, um, Transport Day at COP26 happened more than a month ago, on 11th of November. We are recording today on the 17th mm -hmm. of December. So, after a month, after a month, maybe some emotions faded away, so we can talk maybe a bit, a bit more clear-headed, maybe more reali realistically what happened. Mm -hmm. So, so w first of all, what was your overall impression uh, from the um, Transport Day at COP26 uh, in reference to aviation? And uh, do you consider it a successful touchpoint on the journey towards Destination 2050? I think there are two things that we can say on uh, on your question, Juhosh. Uh The first is um, the mere fact that we are seeing increasingly climate discussion moving to transport. Um, from a, a you know a historical point of view, most of the the pressure and the efforts on the decarbonization have focused on energy production. Um, you see the debate on the decarbonization of uh, of energy, the phasing out of of coal, and as this is happening at a ra rather rapid pace with different uh, pace, you know, uh, in various parts of the world. Um, we're moving now to the, the, the second phase of the decarbonization, so to say, of, of, the, uh, of the economies, and that very much puts the focus on transport. And I think uh, that pressure will continue and will be increasingly important on transport as energy production or industry itself is decarbonizing. That's, um, so in a sense, it's, it's very interesting because that topic will not go away and, and has many challenges. Also, because the options at hand to decarbonize transport across all modes are, are certainly not as, uh, as straightforward as they are uh, in the case of, of industry or energy production. Um, I think that's the first thing uh, that I, I, I want to mention. The second is, we, uh, while we were meeting at the COP on the, on the transport day, um, the, uh, which was the 9th, 9th of November, we were mostly uh, two, almost two years, or 24 months, uh, after the first European airline, uh, or the first airline in the world committed to uh, net zero emissions by 2050. And in these two months, I mean, there are two, two major phenomena that have happened. First is the COVID crisis, which is you know, possibly the worst crisis in aviation history. But in the same time, that is in, in, in these 24 months, we saw uh, uh, roughly, uh, you know, 290 airlines or airline groups uh, across all continents 
uh, committing to net zero emission, and, and that represents 80% uh, uh, of world traffic, which is which is very interesting because not only is it a quite significant commitment to decarbonize, but it also happening at the uh, at the same time that the economic crisis was hitting uh, airlines, and, and we know that the, the aviation sector was one of the worst affected uh, sector. Um, so the the pace for the decarbonization is is, uh, is speeding up and is going ahead. Uh, you know, even if we are uh, and will continue to be for the, the foreseeable future, uh, struggling with the, the recovery from the COVID crisis. Good. So if we go back to the exactly to the transport day at the, at COP COP26, uh, what were it directly your involvement uh, and what maybe what, what were your personal hi highlights from the event? The um, I, I, the, the highlight of the day was the launch of this uh, uh, climate ambition coalition uh, that was uh, uh, piloted and it was very much done at the initiative of the, of the British government, which saw uh, a significant amount of countries signing up. Um, I, I think this, uh, this is one of the uh, state-led um, highlights of the, of the Transport Day, because uh, as is usually the case for uh, UNF C conferences, for COP conferences, there are various different events happening at the same time. You have the actual negotiations, then you have the, the state initiatives, such as the coalition that, we are, uh, that I was mentioning earlier, but then you also have all the industry uh, commitments. And there, for example, uh, we saw the, um, uh, the Clean Skies for Tomorrow initiative making some, some significant pledges. Um, so I think what's, what's interesting is to see that within a day you have all elements of the aviation ecosystem, states, aircraft manufacturers, airlines, fuel producers, uh, you know, uh, focusing or, or narrowing down on one single day to make significant announcements. Um, and I think all together make, make the, uh, uh, the day a, a quite significant uh, milestone also in how aviation is, uh, is being uh, decarbonized. But I, I think what's very interesting for that, and then we hope to see more in the next few years, is um, the momentum that all these elements coming together, whether they're state-led, whether they're industry-led, uh, is creating. Because it's even if we know that most of the decarbonization technology will only be available uh, in large scale in the next uh, five to ten years, uh, what is really key is that we build on the momentum now to push for new innovative ideas, for new ways of uh, tackling the problems and, and, and new ways of, uh, of developing technologies. And I think that that really is, for me, the, the, uh, the highlight of the, uh, um, of the, the transport day. Now, um, from a climate point of view, there's one significant highlight from, from our perspective, uh, which doesn't relate directly to aviation, but has nevertheless a very significant impact on climate change, and that's the, uh, the EU and US-led initiative to cut uh, methane emissions. The, 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 the global methane 30% uh, reduction target, if successfully implemented, is roughly the equivalent of taking every aircraft uh, and every car and every truck uh, in the world and reducing them to net zero by 2030. Um, which means two things is that you know it also highlights the fact that uh, you know aviation's contribution to climate change uh, uh, is limited even if it has to you know to continue and to speed up but also that there are uh, immense uh, f uh, potential for reduction and for contribution to climate change effort also elsewhere in areas that have not been considered until now so we're, we're that that really is from a climate perspective something that, that you know, uh, all have to recognize as, as, as being new and as having a, a massive Im, uh, impact and potential in, in uh, limiting the carbon footprint of, uh, of the European or, or Western industries in the world. Thank you very much for sharing that. I was following the news um, quite closely, I have to say, listening to the po various podcasts, but I have uh, never, uh, never heard, never seen um, this information, this piece of information which you are sharing right now, that basically, uh, thanks to this uh, pledge of uh, decreasing the, the methane um, emissions, that at the same time we will basically reach the net zero for tra transport industry, cars and aviation in 2030. Wow, so... Mm, yeah, very, very valuable information, and it, it tells a lot about the, the scope, what, what we are talking about. Um, uh, you mentioned already the International Aviation Climate Ambition Coalition. 
as, as uh, one of the highlights or the highlight of, of, of the event. Um, um, skeptics might say that uh, 23, antr 23 countries uh, signed it uh, out of those 23, 12 Europeans. So skeptics might ask, so why not more? Why just 23? Uh, I think it's a, it's a good point. And is yeah. it even, does it even make sense if it's just 23 countries? Well, every, every effort and every pledge is, uh, is welcomed. I think, while I, I understand the, the point that you're making, what's very valuable in this coalition is the fact that you also uh, see a number of non-European countries and developing countries signing up. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, countries like Kenya, like Costa Rica, uh, um, uh, Burkina Faso, if I'm not mistaken, and, and possible some, some other ones have also joined to it. And that's very important from a, from a climate negotiation dynamic perspective, because there is indeed a big risk, I and mean, we hear it a lot, that um, the climate change debate you know, turns into a, a north versus south uh, debate. And having con countries such as you know, African countries, South American countries joining is really essential because it shows also that um, whilst you know, uh, having limited uh, uh, CO2 footprint but big ambitions on, on, on aviation, some countries, uh, non-Western non countries, are joining the, uh, the effort and are I, I, I pushing for uh, more ambitious uh, uh, climate action uh, on the aviation sector. So I think this is... This is really the key, the key angle, and I think what what surprised you know uh, many many uh, uh, observers from the uh, this uh, international aviation climate ambition coalition that it was not only you know I would say the usual suspects Europe and uh, uh, North America. Absolutely, thanks a lot for for clarifying that as well. Um, so uh, let's move a little bit to a different topic. Um, from COP26 to, to what you guys are doing at A4E and you were one of the founding members, if we can say it like that, of this Destination 2050 initiative. Um, so it's been already since months. I think it was launched in February, um, if I'm not mistaken. So, of course, from the long term perspective, it's very short time, but but still it's, it's almost a year. So um, since then, how has it been received across the industry? Is, are there potentially any visible steps, any visible progress? Uh, towards decarbonizing, decarbonizing the industry since then? You know, the reaction that we had uh, to Destination 2050 was really phenomenal. We went into the exercise without knowing how far we will be able to go. Uh, from uh, uh, A3 having been the, the initiator uh, and having developed this, this coalition of, of a European aviation stakeholder behind the roadmap, um, we did not expect that it would be able to go as far as we went because it initially started as a, uh, a bottom-up approach. We look at all the measures and policies in place and see how far we go. Single sky, uh, um, sustainable aviation fuels, economic measures, and, and, and so on and so forth. But it was, it was never meant in the beginning to become an exercise on which we would build commitment. But as we went through the process, you start realizing that actually, you know, there is a pathway that shows for aviation to you know, reduce uh, 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 its emission and reach uh, net zero emission by 2050 for all flights. And that same pathway also shows a way to align with the European Green Deal and the Paris Agreement and reduce by 55% by 2030. And so an exercise that initially started as an economic exercise become, turned into a political exercise because it was not only an interesting roadmap, it's also something on which you build a vision and a commitment. And, and that exercise is only going ahead. We are looking now into uh, uh, detailing this roadmap and it will be taking stock of the progress in the next few, uh, in the next few years. So the, uh, in a sense, the, 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 this has really become uh, a unifying um, moment for, for the aviation industry. Uh, and, and also, uh, as we were exchanging and presenting the roadmap to stakeholders and, and policymakers and, and NGOs, uh, it, it's been established now as the first comprehensive regional industry roadmap of, of its kind across all industrial sectors um, because it goes into such level of details because it includes all the, uh, the actors of an ecosystem, traffic controllers, airport manufacturers, and we hope, by the way, that we'll be able to get more members of the ecosystem on board to, to join this pledge. Uh, it's very unique in this kind and uh, it's also interesting from a, from a policy perspective because it also recognized that at some point, uh, as regulators, as policymakers, there's only so far you can go to press an industry to decarbonize. At some point, because of the intricacies, because of the, the, uh, the linkages between all these policies, you have to allow an industry to take over and say, we understand, we share the vision, but uh, 
the, the policymakers can never be perfect in the way it addresses because of all the linkages. So the industry has to, at some point, take it over from there and say, now we make a, this detailed roadmap. Because nowhere you would have imagined uh, uh, politicians or MPs to be able to develop a roadmap that is so detailed, that involves so, such a... Uh, such a, a, a level of, of a granular uh, action points, uh, who needs to do what by which moment. That's that's really the main the main uh, uh, positive uh, element of it, and and uh, so much so that we are we are now actively engaged in discussion of, of supporting and developing roadmaps elsewhere in the world, South America, uh, Asia Pacific. Um, whilst we are all hoping to see the 2022 ICAO being the year where long-term inspirational goal will be set, we know that it will be difficult. We just talked about Glasgow, we know that not all countries in the world will be going at the same pace. So it's also important for us that in parallel of pushing for an agreement uh, at the multilateral level, at ICAO, we also start thinking that maybe there's also progress that needs to be done on a region-by-region -region basis, because it's very likely that if nobody, not everybody can decarbonize at the same pace across the world, that then you still have to work with those who are the most willing. Absolutely, and it's great to see uh, this this document, uh, Destination 2050, uh, uh, seeing as an example, as a role model potentially for other regions regions in the world. And as you are saying, the the the, the pace is probably not the same in every region of the world, but. Uh, Every every single step counts, and it, uh, even as I think it's the old Chinese pro proverb that says, even a thousand miles miles journey starts with a single step. So every single step counts for sure. Um, before we start to wrap up, uh, one quick question about um, a single European sky. You mentioned it, it very quickly, and I noticed recently that your colleagues from from A4 we were very vocal on on LinkedIn or on social media about uh, bringing this topic again into. Uh, into the discussion. Um, so, where are we now? Is it? Uh, are we getting any closer? Is it? Uh, and is there any chance we can we can get it done sh uh, shortly? Because I heard from many many industry people. I think especially uh, your your current president Johan Lundgren from EasyJet was very vocal about that. That basically we can slash the emissions overnight, twenty uh, ten or even more percent. Uh, we just need to get it implemented finally. Well, uh, Juraj, I, I wish I had uh, positive news for you, but I'm afraid that our president is uh, is right about this. Um, the progress, no, we don't see it. Uh, it there are still negotiations that are open, um, and, and that's an opportunity for progress to be made. But, um, but the past six months haven't seen significant progress, which is, which is really... Uh, uh, you know, hard to understand, and it's it's between you and me. It's it's also uh, uh, rather shocking. You know that the industry uh, will have to go through massive changes, huge investment in hydrogen, in electric, in sustainable fuels, in new aircraft, it's billions of euros that will have to be paid for by the customer in some shape and form, or by taxpayers. Um, whilst at the same time, uh, we have options on the table that are short term, low cost that can go yeah, that can that can deliver up to 10% of co2 emission reductions that is the basis of the decarbonization uh, uh, objective the 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 starting point for limiting your negative externalities or your 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 carbon footprint is more efficiency what's the point of of developing these expensive technologies if in the first place you're not using it in the best way possible and that's what the single european sky and you know improvement atm in operation is all about it's short term and slow cost and and also one of these few things that uh, that would allow the, the the aviation industry to reduce emissions in the short term because most of the, te the technologies will only be available at large scale you know in 2030 and 2040 if you speak to the generation gen z you know the teenagers and all the people who are rightly pushing for climate action they are you know 2050 you know um they they you know that that seems like a, another world you know far exactly. away it's 2030 mm -hmm. is what matters, and that's what the single European sky is about: is the, you know, uh, is um, uh, delivering reduction of CO2 emission in the short term. So very quickly, one more question. So the the barrier is is politics. So some countries are not ready to give up the the control of their uh, sovereign air, airspace. Is that correct? Can we say which countries are they? I, I, my guess would be that many or many or most of the countries are already in line, but there are some who are blocking that. Can we can we say which ones are they? I think there's a number of, of countries, and I would say the larger European countries, and those who are the most 
uh, prone to um, uh, desire to to uh, uh, to stick to sovereign a sovereign approach to the to the airspace. Um, I think uh, we have issues with uh, uh, with you know countries like France, like Germany, uh, who you know who we wish to be able to you know to see taking a, a more uh, pro-European approach to the decarbonization and, and, to, uh, and to, the, uh, to the ATM efficiency. Um, now, where, where there may be light at the end of the tunnel is that, uh, and this is what some, uh, something we hear now in the discussion in the Council, is that the, the, um, uh, the, fra the, regular, the regulatory framework as provided by the single European sky, uh, whilst not being uh, improved or reformed, may uh, does not prevent uh, technological uh, advances uh, to happen outside of this framework. And I think this is something that we will be looking into very much uh, into, uh, into as part of the next step. But it, it will need to be a, a political dis discussion, and, uh, and that also means that uh, you know, the issues related to sovereignty, really related to uh, you know, European... Uh, uh, commitment or commitment to, to you know putting together resources, agreeing that you know it's not all about standing behind your own borders, um, uh, will have to be uh, will, will have to be looked into. And unfortunately, um, if you look at the latest you know uh, trends, you know politically this is not this is not the most popular uh, uh, narrative to push to to voters. You know, uh, in the contrary, I mean we are you know generally in the mood where people are, are looking into retracting behind their borders and. Um, I think that's true for the aviation sector as it's true for, for freedom of movement, for, for other elements. Yes, yeah, so hopefully there will be some, some progress in the next maybe few months or, or, or years in, in, in the worst case. Um, we've talked today a lot about what has been done already, about all the initiatives, uh, pledges, about uh, working together as an industry, as, as, as countries, as associations. Um, uh, at the same time, I hear from from uh, many people within the industry that that we as aviation we are not vocal enough about all the progress that has been done I in the in the even decades and 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 years that uh, we still we have the we have the reputation that we are one of the bad guys that flying uh, that sitting on a plane and flying to do whatever, whatever in the business tourism uh, visiting friends and relatives uh, is the worst thing in the world, which obviously is not the case. So, w what's your view on that? How how can we make that perception changed? I, I think I mean the perception is what it is. If indeed you know we see a big discre uh, uh, discrepancy between actual CO two emission from aviation and perceived CO two emission from aviation, uh, uh, which is huge. You know, um, aviation can be you know uh, in, in some surveys will will be. Uh, uh, blame for 25, 20, 26 percent of CO2 emission. Well, we're way below that, as you know, two or three percent uh, um, at worst. But that shouldn't be an excuse for the aviation sector not to decarbonize. Whoever is small, your carbon footprint, Absolutely. everybody has yeah. to make an effort. And it's true for us, and it's true for all the sectors of the economy. Um, what I think you're, you're right at is, is mentioning the, the, uh, the difficulty that the aviation sector also has at, at uh, communicating on its... Uh, its uh, its advances and its progress, and there I think the big uh, the big challenge is also to speak beyond the aviation uh, echoing room, so to say. Uh, I think the aviation uh, uh, ecosystem, which you know very well, is uh, has you know is very well connected. You know, people follow development of the aviation industry, and it's a quite closed off community in a sense. But beware of that echoing room because this is not where you know you need to communicate. Uh, the aviation sector needs to be at Glasgow to talk about aviation. Needs to be talking about, you know, to civil society on the general uh, societal challenges that the decarbonisation means. We are, you know, that that's really a debate that ha uh, that has to happen outside of the aviation sector. And I think this is where the big challenge is: break out those barriers and and avoid the uh, the, the, the speaking only to the industry, but speak to to outside of the industry, directly to customers, to the energy uh, uh, community to the climate NGOs, uh, even those who are not involved in the aviation sector. I think this is where the big challenge is going to be in the next few years.
100 percent uh, laurent thanks a lot for the discussion today you really appreciate it all your insights fingers crossed with, with all of your hard work and your colleagues at a a4e for uh, getting closer to destination 2050 with every single step um and the last question before i i let you go the one i always ask at the very end um, what do you love the most about aviation well aviation is uh, uh, impressive in the sense that um it's uh, for me who, uh, who, uh, who's very uh, pro-European. It's uh, it's the basis of the, the the building of European identity. Um, if you look at at how people traveled across borders uh, 30, 40 years ago, uh, I believe that you know facilitating people going on Erasmus, uh, people going on holiday, is what you need to to uh, to build this European identity. And you need more of that rather than less. Uh, we, you know, uh, uh, I'm very uh, concerned about what we were talking about earlier, which is people retracting behind their borders. I think we need more connection between people. We need more people traveling and they need to travel better. You know, they need to and we need to, to make a better effort. But overall, the solution is not to travel less. The solution is to travel better and, uh, and, and to travel more. Um, and I think that's what aviation, uh, aviation will, will continue to do, especially for in those regions that are, you know, that don't have alternatives. Where you don't find, you know, easy, uh, easy ways to access services, education, goods, uh, 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 you know, across across the world, and that's what aviation can can enable people to do. Amen to that. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Laurent. All the best. Thank you.